Hello and welcome to Lesson 6 in the Permanent Way series where I use city skylines to explain railway concepts with varying degrees of success. This time we're going to talk about basic junctions, so essentially looking at the simpler forms of connection between railway lines. A major benefit of railway systems is that they are essentially a form of modular infrastructure where traffic requirements are low, only a single line is required. If traffic is heavy or if there is a significant variation in speed or in stopping patterns, then multiple lines can be used. Enabling this flexibility requires a way for tracks to diverge and converge, and this is achieved using switches and crossings, commonly abbreviated to S and C. Switches, turnouts or points are the means by which tracks diverge and converge, whilst crossings permit the intersection of tracks at the same level. Combine the switch and crossing and you get a switch and crossing unit. These S and C units must be able to be traversed in both directions. The normally set direction, usually the straight or flatter radius track, is called the through route, and the switch direction is called the turnout route. In other words, the leg of the switch with the flatter radius is the through route, and the leg with the tighter radius is the turnout route. Where a switch diverges in the primary direction of travel, it's called a facing switch. A trailing switch is one that converges in the primary direction of travel. Ideally, all SNC would be positioned on straight and level track, though this is often difficult within existing railway corridors, thus it is possible to position SNC on regular horizontal curves. Owing to the difficulty manufacturing crossings to provide a constantly changing curvature, as well as the natural tendency of transition geometry to degrade over time, locating switches and crossings on horizontal transitions must be avoided. Similarly, locating SNC on vertical curves, particularly convex curves, must be avoided, as this can result in the switch tips and the crossing nose becoming prominent, which increases their rate of wear and in extreme cases can result in derailment. SNC should be located away from underbridges, overbridges, level crossings, and platforms, and multiple SNC units should be adequately spaced from each other. Now, why is that? Let's take level crossings as an example. These are an area of high risk for derailment compared to the rest of the railway. You've got an uncontrolled highway system and trains can't stop very quickly. If you locate S&C close to a level crossing, you risk increasing the severity of a derailment substantially. A good example of this is in 2004 in Ufton Nerve It. The proximity of facing points to the level crossing meant that a train that had been derailed upright ended up getting split and spread across the track and resulting in far more harm to the passengers of that train than might have otherwise occurred. Let's look at the most basic S&C unit. That's a turnout on straight track. So here we have the through route, in this case nice simple ballasted track, rails on top of sleepers, and we've got the turnout route where we've got a track diverging or converging. So if we take away all the sleepers where you need to position all of your metal work so that you can actually slip these two tracks apart, we then replace them with what are known as bearers. So sleepers uh, have a special cross section designed just for a single track. Bearers are flat top so you can position rails on them wherever you like and attach base plates and all sorts of other wonderful metal work. And the bearer at the very end is called the last long bearer. The dimension from one end of the SNC unit to the last long bearer at the other end is an important one for designers. Then we have the switch blades. These are machined down to as thin a point as possible, and that point is called the switch toe. Then we introduce gaps into the running edge to allow the wheel flanges to pass through, either going on the through route or the turnout route. Then we add check rails. Whilst in 99% of cases these will never be contacted by the wheel of a train passing through, they just allow that extra bit of security just in case a wheel set happens to be dynamically oscillating in slightly the wrong direction as the wheels pass through the gap in the crossing nose. We then need a points motor of some kind. That might be a lever, but usually it's some sort of electromechanical device that actually operates and slides the switch blades from one position to the other. And that's where we get the name of a switch. It's a switch that allows trains to pass in either one direction or another. The common crossing is generally a large cast steel unit, but in longer, faster SNC units, this can actually be a continuous running edge with a swing nose. We'll maybe talk about that in the future. Overall, this then gives us the SNC unit. In this instance, a standard turnout on a straight. Switches are generally defined by their length, whereas crossings are generally defined by their intersecting angle. In Britain, at least, length is defined by a letter, and the intersecting angle is usually described using a one-in value. That might be different in other places, for example, angles rather than one-in values are usually used uh, in mainland Europe. So in Britain at least, the bigger the letter, the longer the switch, and the higher the number, the shallower the crossing angle. In both cases, this means higher turnout speeds. Whilst we try to avoid doing so, we can bend these S&C units over where track needs to be curved, or, as a bit of a bodge, we can create an equal split switch to get a shallower angle and a higher turnout speed, a bit like I'm showing here with this vandalised rubber. As with regular plane line track, increasing curvature, or decreasing the radius, reduces the speed that the turnout route can be traversed. If the through route curvature increases, the equivalent radius and turnout speed will decrease. Flip that over, 
a larger SNC unit is required to give the same turnout speed. Where we have SNC on a curve, we categorize it in two ways. If the turnout route and the through route have the same curvature, as in they're curving the same direction, we call that similar flexure. If the turnout route and the through route are in opposing directions, we call that contraflexure. There are many different types of SNC unit with increased complexity generally permitting greater operational flexibility in a smaller footprint. However, complex SNC is generally not preferable because it costs a lot more to maintain, it's tricky, expensive and complex to install, and it means you've got to have a big pile of spare parts. The two most commonly used SNC units are turnouts and crossovers. We've already looked at turnouts. Crossovers are basically two turnouts back to back, allowing trains to pass between two parallel tracks. So where you've got two tracks next to each other separated by a standard interval. In the UK, we call that a six foot. An SNC unit that allows trains to pass from one to the other over the standard six foot is called a crossover. Other types of SNC unit include diamond crossings, switch diamonds, scissors crossovers, and then after that you start getting things like tandems, slips, double slips. These are all forms of complex SNC, and in modern layouts we do our very best to avoid them. Now that's all fine and good, but what exactly do city skylines allow us to do in terms of SNC? Firstly, it's very important to understand that city skylines are very strict in controlling which direction trains go along tracks. So that means, for example, that you can't draw crossovers between parallel tracks in city skylines. In fact, the only place where you'll see crossovers in city skylines is at the very edge of the map or at either side of stations and freight terminals. With the addition of single track, city skylines allow you to do single track with standard turnouts. Nice and easy. More often, you'll find yourself drawing double junctions in city skylines. This is something in the real world that we try and avoid, but in city skylines, probably the most common type of junction you'll find yourself drawing. Single and double tracks can pass through each other, giving you flat crossings, and depending on the angle, you might find also that City Skylines draws automatic slips as well. So there is a reasonable complexity of SNC you can draw with City Skylines, although you don't have much control over it. But what about speeds and the lengths and angles of switches and crossings? Well, in City Skylines, you're limited to one, at least in vanilla. What I mean by that is the switch length and the crossing angles are all the same no matter how you draw your SNC. The switches are very, very short, and the crossing angles are one in one, so it's a 45 degree angle between the through route and the turnout route. Now given that the real world has crossing angles no tighter than one in eight, you get an idea of what a funny shape this crossing is. In reality, this doesn't really matter. Much like horizontal and vertical geometry, railway layouts and city skylines are a bit like creating a model railway. You're emulating the reality, but you're not necessarily recreating it perfectly. And indeed, in the next lesson, we're going to be creating a new freight line, a new single track line connecting a mining area with a processing area, where we'll put all of this stuff, that's basic junctions, horizontal and vertical geometry, into practice. I'm looking forward to seeing you then. Cheerio!